turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 22. And this story that I'm going to read appears in all four of the Gospels. And, and, you know, it's one of those stories that if you took the time to read all four of the versions, you could get a little bit more information and a little bit more information about the story. Um, how about if I just kind of bring in that information instead of taking the time to read all four versions? But I'm going to read from Luke chapter 22, and, and um, I'm going to start up in verse 31. Now, my main text that I'm going to preach from is a little further down, but I've, I've got to set the scene for you. Um, and in verse 31, Jesus tells, he addresses Simon, which is Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to go into what it means to be sifted by Satan, but that's not a pleasant experience. And it is Satan's desire to sift God's people. And he says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. I love the fact that he had to ask to do that. Verse 32, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, now there's, there's something prophetic about what Jesus is saying. He's saying you're going to mess up, but I've prayed that your faith doesn't ultimately fail and you're going to turn back. You're going to come back. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Uh, here's Peter's reply. He's, man, I can relate to Peter. He's a little mouthy sometimes, isn't he? But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know who I am. And then Jesus asked them, when I sent you out with a purse, bag of sand, a bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Uh, without a purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, "But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. For it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. He's telling his disciples." I'm about to go to the cross and give my life for you. And the disciples said, <laughs> I can relate to these guys too. See, Lord, here are two swords. He just said, you know, sell what you have and go buy a sword. Here are two swords. And, and here's his reply. That's enough. Now that's, he's not saying, well, that's enough swords. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can't fight a battle with just two swords. Um, and what he's saying is, when he says that's enough, it's kind of like when my mother used to say to my brother and me, that's just about enough of that. What, what that means is that's enough of that nonsense. Now, verse 39, Jesus went out as usual. And I have underlined in my Bible as usual. To the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you don't fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. And an angel, he prayed, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he arose from prayer and went back to the disciples, guess what they were doing? Look at your neighbor and say, I think this applies to you. How many of you have ever fallen asleep when you were praying? <laughs> I have to be honest with you, I have. I, I'm like, I'm going to really earnestly pray tonight. I get down on my, I've knelt down on my knees at my chair and fallen asleep in that position, praying. It's like, well, I had good intentions, Lord. He found them asleep, exhausted. 
from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, as he's still speaking, this crowd shows up in the garden to arrest him, and one of the twelve was leading him. We know who that was. It was Judas. He kissed Jesus, betrayed him with a kiss. He asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? In verse 49, look at this. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Remember those two swords they have? There's a crowd of people who are armed, y'all, and they've got two swords, and they go, you want us to use our swords now? And the Bible says one of them. Now, if we took the time to read this in other accounts of the Gospels, we know who it was. It was Peter, the one who said, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. Peter took out his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. In fact, the other accounts will tell us that this guy's name was Malchus. He's a servant of the high priest. He has a relative who's a servant of the high priest, Caiaphas. And that becomes important a little bit later. But he cut off his right ear and Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Imagine if you were in that crowd. It's no wonder when they were looking for Jesus and he answered and said, I am he, one, ver one uh, account of this says they all fell back. They fell like to the ground. They fell back from him. Well, no wonder. This, this man they're there to arrest has power they've never seen before. And so go on down to verse 54. I want to get to um, the main part of my story. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed from a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. And, you know, children sometimes don't know when to be quiet. And I just envision this. I, I don't know how young she was, but I envision her tugging on her mom or dad's garment saying, hey, this man was with that man. And verse 57, but he, Peter, denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted. And if we read this from one of the other gospels, guess who it was that recognized him this time? It was a servant of Mal, or it was a relative rather of Malchus. Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. In fact, another of the gospel says, your accent gives you away. Having lived in other parts of the country, I often am at, have been asked, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> um, and I, I say, no, your accent gives you away. And that was the case here with Peter. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, other, other gospels tell us he even called down curses from heaven. Now, that doesn't mean he's using cuss words. It means he's saying kind of like people say nowadays, may God strike me dead if I'm lying. And I always say, please don't say that in our church. I'm not sure our insurance would cover that. <laughs> but look at this. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. 
I want to talk to you about the crowing of the rooster. The crowing of the rooster. Let me say a prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that this morning, through your Holy Spirit, we would hear and heed the crowing of the rooster. Let it be a wake-up call for your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, I love to talk about my sons now that they're grown men. But when they were about three or four years old, and I think I've told this story here before, but we were eating breakfast in a restaurant one day, and somebody commented that the eggs didn't taste right. And I, I said, they don't. And Andrew, who was about three or four years old, he looked at me and, and he said, they do taste funny. And being the dad that I am, I looked at my young son and I said, well, maybe that's because those aren't chicken eggs. Maybe those are rooster eggs. And this little boy looked at me with the funniest look and said, Daddy, roosters don't lay eggs, chickens lay eggs. And I thought, how does he know that at three or four years old? I'm not raising him on a farm. Well, continuing this dad joke over the years, we go out to eat and uh, to this day, Sometimes when the waitress comes to the table, and if I'm ordering something that has an option of either chicken or beef, she'll say, do you want chicken, like nachos, you know, do you want chicken or beef? And sometimes I'll look at the waitress and I'll say, well, you know, I don't eat a lot of chicken, but I do like rooster meat. Do you have any rooster meat? And I get all kinds of reactions. Sometimes the waitress will roll her eyes, you know, sometimes my son will roll his eyes. Sometimes I'll have a waitress that says, well, I don't know, let me go check. And some of them will say, you know, I think we're all out of rooster today, but we do have chicken if you want that. Um, and, I, you know, just recently I was, I don't know, I, sometimes it's amazing what you thank God for, you know, like coffee. Or, and I was, just the other day I was thinking about, you know, how grateful I am that God created chickens and he saved them on the ark. Can you imagine living in a world without chicken? I mean, there would be no Chick-fil-A. What kind of world would this be? You know, rapture me out of here, God. What's the use? And so, I like chicken. Sometimes I don't like roosters. When I was a kid, we had free-range chickens and roosters. Well, I would catch them because there was a trucking company nearby that, that would truck chickens, and, and I don't know how in the world I caught those, but... I, you know, a few would escape, and I would catch them and bring them home. They'd run around the yard, and, and let me tell you, roosters can be mean. I've, I've known a couple of attack roosters. Who needs a dog? They'll chase you all over the yard like they own the place. And uh, when I moved here to pastor the church a few years ago, there was a neighbor down the road. Some of you know this neighbor. <laughs> He had some free-range chickens, and he had a free-range rooster. <clears throat> and this rooster, and, and I didn't mind them coming down in my yard because, you know, they eat bugs and things. and That was fine, but uh, the rooster found his way down in the yard. And this rooster would sit on, perch on the, the rail of my deck just outside the window, and at dawn would just throw his head back and sing the song of the morning. And I don't know how, but apparently roosters are smart because um, he also figured out which of those windows on the house is my bedroom window. And that rooster, I kid you not, would come to my bedroom window, which happened to put him about five feet from my pillow. And, and, and at dawn, and, and, you know, sometimes I would get home late from work and I was tired and, you know, you get in bed at, at one or two in the morning and, and there he was, crowing. So it turns out I like rooster as well as I like chicken. No, I'm kidding. I, I didn't do anything to the neighbor's rooster, but um, I can't hear a rooster crow without thinking of this story. And when I hear a rooster crow, I think of Peter, and I think about the fact that, listen to me, God, who we're told works in mysterious ways, 
will use anything and everything he can use in your life to get your attention. I, I mean, if, if you just scroll through the pages of Scripture, you'll, you'll find that he, he even used a talking donkey to save a prophet's life. Boy, that now I'm telling you, that would get my attention. But today we see, in fact, he's used fish. He used a fish to pay taxes. I, you know, people ask me, why do you fish so much? Well, I have to pay taxes. You never know. Look in his mouth. Might be a coin. He used a great big fish to send a, a prophet to Nineveh. And so God can use a rooster. God can use anything. How many of you have ever had a wake-up call in your life? Something that happened, something that was said, something you saw and, and you just stop for a moment and go, okay, that was God right there, and I hear you. That's where Peter was this day, when the rooster crowed. Let me talk about blending in with the crowd. And please, as I preach this part, don't elbow your neighbor and say, boy, he's talking about you. The Bible tells us that Peter followed from a distance and then ended up sitting down with them by the fire blending in that's what i call that he's just trying to look like one of them have you ever have don't have you ever tried to blend in in a place where you didn't belong or in a crowd that you weren't really part of i mean have you have you ever just you didn't fit in maybe or, or whatever you just tried to you know, blend in with the crowd. And, and in fact, that's what Peter was trying to do, and it's really not working well for him. He has this distinct dialect of Galilean, and people start to recognize him. It gets more and more difficult to blend in. And I'm going to say something that, I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll help someone, but I'm just going to say it. There, there are some places that God will not let you blend in. And there are some people that you might want to run with that, that God's not going to let you blend in with them. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? You know, I, I have at times wore a, a, a clerical collar, you know, kind of like a more liturgical pastor wears. And I do that sometimes for formal things like a wedding or something. And I have sometimes said, I think every Christian ought to have to wear one of those out in public for two weeks. Because you don't blend in. So could you go to the same places and be with the same people and do the same things if you were wearing such a collar? <laughs> so, you know, God's not going to let you just blend in sometimes. And Peter, the reason God's not letting you blend in here is because you have on your life a calling that is a divine calling. Jesus had changed his name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. Jesus had declared upon this rock, I will build my church. And to be perfectly honest with you, church builders just don't blend in very well with the world. And I think that's part of the problem, especially when it comes to the American church culture. Because so much of American church tries to look like and act like and talk like and be like the world. And God didn't call us to be like them. He called us to stand out. He said, come out from among them. You know, you're supposed to stand out. He never intended for us to blend in. And that's, that's why he has, has made it so difficult. And he's following from a distance. And, and, and notice the progression here. He's, he's walking with them. And then he ends up sitting down with them. It's kind of like that scripture in Psalm number one, verse one, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Because when we're walking with them and we're trying to blend in with them, we end up standing with them. And then when we end up standing with them and trying to blend in all the more with them, guess what? We, we end up sitting down where they sit. 
And God calls us to come out from among them and be separate. God, you know, let me just say this, boy, God has a way of exposing your faith. God has a way of exposing you as one of his. I mean, God will put you in an uncomfortable position where you have no, where, well, you do have a choice, where you have a choice of either having your faith or faltering from it. He'll put you in situations where you'll have to choose to be exposed as a Christian or hide as one. He'll expose who you say you are and what you say you believe. And some people, like Peter, are afraid of being judged and criticized for what you believe and what you stand for. And so we just kind of keep our mouth closed and kind of try to blend in as we sit by the fire of this world. And God says, I think I'm going to expose you. That's because he wants the world to recognize us. He doesn't want there to be any mistake. When people see Todd Steffi, I mean, it's not that I'm great or I'm perfect or I'm holier than thou, but people, he, God wants people to know when, he, when they see Todd Steffi that, that, hey, he's a Christian. He belongs to the Lord. He's a servant of the Lord. It's not because I'm something special. He doesn't want me to blend in. He wants the world to recognize us that we are his and that we belong to Jesus Christ. And so he keeps putting people in our life that goes, hey, you're, you're one of his friends. Oh, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And then someone else who says, didn't I see you at church one time? I don't know. Now, let me, let me talk to you about how he gets in this mess. And, and basically, it involves arguing at the table, sleeping in the garden, and fighting with the wrong sort. So, in fact, one writer said that Peter's denial of Christ was really the climax of, of a series of failures. Isn't that so true about all of us? So here's what led up to him disowning three times that he knows Jesus. Trust me when I say this had been a long night in Peter's life. Verse 3 tells us that Satan had already entered into Judas and that he had already agreed to betray Jesus by the time they sat down at the table at the Passover meal, something that we call the Last Supper. They're sitting at the table. Jesus is explaining to them that the cup he gives them is the, quote, new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. That's the conversation. He breaks the bread and tells them, quote, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then Jesus tells them, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. So Jesus is telling them, one of you will betray me. I'm going to die for you. And that's the conversation. And this would have been a, Really good time probably for his disciples to be taking notes. It always amazed me when I had students who would just sit there and stare and not take notes. I had a student one time, I, I would, was lecturing college class, and, and I, he just would sit there. And I said, aren't you going to write any of this down? And he goes, I got it. I got it. And I said, well, we'll see in a few days. This would have been a good time for his disciples to be writing some things down. This sounds like something we might need to know later. I mean, his blood being poured out and the bread being broken. It's his body and some hand at the table that's going to betray him. And they begin to question among themselves who it is that's going to betray him. And the Bible... The Bible tells you, you got to see, it's in verse 24. There's a verse that says, and a dispute. You know what a dispute is? It's an argument. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. So we're talking about some one of us is going to betray him, and that somehow turns into, well, 
one of you is a loser and the rest of us, one of us must be the greatest. Are you kidding me? He's explaining the new covenant and we're going to argue over which of us is the greatest. And they argue at the table and apparently, especially Peter, who says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. How noble. Jesus says, you're going to deny that you know me three times tonight. He goes to the garden to pray. He tells his disciples, pray that you don't enter into temptation. He comes back and he finds them sleeping. Jesus is speaking to them. The crowds show up. And, you know, he just got through telling them, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one because I'm about to die. And they say, well, here's two swords. And he says, that's enough of that. I wonder if he did this. That's enough. And so the disciples, when they come to arrest Jesus so quickly, Peter draws his sword, strikes the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name is Malchus. And remember that name. Jesus wasn't talking about a physical sword. He's talking about a spiritual sword. He's talking about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You're going to have to, the word of God is described as a sword that is, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Peter, that's the sword you need. Peter is arguing, and he's sleeping, and then he pulls his sword. Well, that brings us to his three denials, <clears throat> and it brings us really to what I call <clears throat> the message of the rooster. Please don't make me crow like a rooster, but you remember how roosters sound? I have said... And if this ever shows up in a book, I please somebody stand up and say, Pastor Todd Steffi used to say that. But I have said that one of the best sermons ever preached was preached by a rooster. And it is proof that the effectiveness of preaching is not in the eloquence of the speaker, but in the anointing that God puts on the preacher. A rooster. He's arguing. He's sleeping. He wants to fight. But now he finds himself sitting by the fire. Jesus is standing there as a prisoner. And Peter is supposed to be the rock upon which Jesus is going to build this thing called the church. How is this possible? Remember, he used a fish to pay taxes. He used a donkey to save a prophet. God will use anything to get our attention. Peter, in Luke's account, <clears throat> he denied three times. He's trying to blend in, and, and God doesn't want Peter to blend in. And he's getting Peter ready for the crowing of the rooster. So the first person comes up, little servant girl, and says, sees him in the firelight, looks closely at him, says, this man was with him. And John's gospel, John's version, you aren't, she actually puts it in the form of sort of this question, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? Peter simply said, I'm not. That, now see, when you, sometimes it's how you word the question that makes it much more difficult to answer and lie. You're not one of his, are you? No. And a little later, someone else says, you also are one of them. I'm not. And this person is the one who says, your accent gives you away. You're, you're a Galilean. And I just, I wonder if he tried to maybe change his accent a little bit. I am not a Galilean. 
And, you know, at one time he calls down curses. The third time this guy comes and he says, you're one of them. And what's significant is in one of the Gospels, it tells us who this man was. This man was a relative of Malchus, whose right ear Peter had cut off in the garden. Oh, now see, it's getting harder to deny him now. Now this guy goes, didn't I just see you in the garden? See, I've got a cousin who had his right ear cut off two hours ago. And that man standing down there bound as a prisoner healed him. And you look like the guy who had the sword. And this, this is when he called down curses. And at that moment, a rooster threw back his head and preached a sermon that Peter would never forget. And Jesus looked at Peter from across the courtyard, bound as a prisoner. And in that moment, Jesus revealed to Peter that while I may stand here bound as a prisoner, I am really the sovereign creator of all things. And I'm ultimately in control, even of a rooster. And the rooster invited Peter to come back to Jesus, and this was the moment that he remembered the words of Jesus. And when you come back, strengthen your brothers. You want to know the, let me give you the points of that rooster sermon as I close. Here's, here's, here's what Peter heard in the crowing of the rooster. Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan is after you. But I've prayed for you, specifically that your faith will not fail. Isn't that a beautiful message? Second point of the rooster sermon is the invitation to come back. You're going you're gonna to wander away. You're going to mess up. But Jesus always invites you back. And he'll give you a wake-up call in the crowing of the rooster to bring you back. And it's the message of forgiveness and restoration. Hallelujah. And the third point of this rooster's sermon as Jesus looked across the courtyard at him, the third point was, I'm sovereign over that rooster, so I'm certainly sovereign over your life and whatever circumstance you're facing right now, I've got this. Just like I've got that rooster, I've got you, and I've, I'm in control. What will God use to get our attention? He's used a lot of things in my life. And you know, I've been in places where I've tried to blend in and it was difficult. And I'm so thankful that the good Lord said, I'm not going to let you blend in here because I've got a better purpose for you. There have been times that I have, I've never, I can't say I've just walked away from Christ and my faith in Christ, but there have been times I didn't live up to the faith I said I had. Maybe you've been there. I thank God for the crowing of the rooster in my life because he always invited me back and he said, I forgive you. I restore you. By the way, Peter was the guy who a few days later preached one of the first sermons in what we call the church. And 3,000 
people, 3,000 souls were saved. 3,000 people gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ in one short sermon. And it's not the eloquence of the speaker. It's the anointing that God puts on that rooster. And here's, here's Peter crowing like a rooster after being filled with the Holy Spirit. God used him. He was the rock upon which he built that church, right? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? And I want you to bow your heads and search your heart. And if you, if you'd say, Pastor, I, I thank God for giving me a wake-up call today. I want to I want to just kind of draw back into Him and recommit myself to the Lord. With your heads bowed, if you'd just raise your hand, I just want to. Yes, anyone else? Yes, anyone else? I see. Yep. Well, very good. Let me pray. Hallelujah. I thank you, God, for your presence. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this room and in, this, in our midst. I pray that you will give us that wake-up call. Lord, across this nation, everyone who hears this message, let, let people's hearts be stirred. Let the message be clear that the day is short, the shadows are lengthening, the coming of the Lord is at hand, and let us be ready. Let us not blend in with the world, but let us stand out more and more for the faith that we say we have. And God, these people who are rededicating themselves to you, I pray that you kindle a fire in them, that you fill them and baptize them in your Holy Spirit. And let them be, just like Peter was, a voice to the world proclaiming the truth of what Jesus has done in their lives. Hallelujah. And I pray for your peace over your people. I pray for Jerusalem. I pray for Israel. I pray for the innocent people who are dying and even the Palestinians, the innocent Palestinians, Lord. I pray for peace. Your will be done as your coming draws near. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen.